Good morning and happy Sabbath to you all. I thank Pastor Sean and Pastor John for the privilege of sharing the pulpit with me today. And it's indeed a privilege that we will be spending some time, in spite of our diversity, we will be united in the Word of God. Are you ready to study the Word of God? Because I'm ready. I hope you also are. Is everything okay with the slides? I think it works like this, right? We are celebrating our diversity today. We are celebrating the different parts of the world we come from. But as I just said, we will have a few moments where we can spend together some time in the Word of God. Now, today we are celebrating our International Day, but at the same time, we are also celebrating the end of our 10 days of prayer, Pastor Sean. Uh, if you were privileged to have joined us here, I could not come every evening, Dan. You, you have noticed that. But each time we came, we were either here or there, and we have been praying. And the common theme that ran through all these 10 days of prayer was Jesus, our high priest. So pray for me as I try to combine an international day, as I try to combine the end of the 10 days of prayer. I have chosen to remain in this theme of the sanctuary because I believe that it has so many lessons to teach us. Are you ready for one only? Because of time, I have chosen only one single lesson from the sanctuary. And I would like to show you how from the Word of God, indeed, our house here, our church here at Atherton, can become this international house of prayer. And you will discover from the Word of God, I hope, another lesson that you will not forget, because it is the Word of God. So we will remain in the sanctuary where we have been for the last 10 days with the high priest. And we will go to the first thing we see if we are to come to the temple. But before we go to the word of God, I invite you to pray. Let's pray together. Gracious Father in heaven, we pray that you will calm down our racing minds and thoughts and that we will focus on you and on your word at this time. I pray that your word will not go back to you void, that it, it will have an impact in my life and in the lives of my friends as well. Help us understand and practice what you are going to teach us this morning because we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. So I said that we are going to focus on the very first thing we see if we were to come to the earthly sanctuary. And what would that be? Now, if I were in a different setting, I would have asked you to turn to your neighbor and to tell him or her something, but my wife tells me it doesn't work in North America. So I will refrain from doing that. But there is one thing I want you to remember, which is the key thought of what I'm going to share with you in the next 28 minutes. And this is it. In the sanctuary service, we find God's ultimate goal for salvation. And this is what I want you to remember. I would have told you to tell that to your neighbor. The ultimate goal, if you were to take salvation and boil it down, this is what you would have received. The ultimate goal of salvation, ultimately, it is for God to, re to reunite you with him. That's the ultimate goal of salvation, is to restore this relationship that was broken and he will not leave any stone unturned to reach his goal. What's his goal? What's the ultimate goal of salvation? To restore this relationship between man and God. Amen. You can go home. Amen. That's the ultimate goal of salvation. And whatever he does, he will do with that goal in mind. He will not go, he, he will do everything he can 
to restore that relationship. And towards the end, I'm planning to show you how prayer contributes to that, to restore this broken relationship. So that is why every single detail, what did I say? Every single detail that is from the sanctuary transpires this goal of God. Every single detail. But I intentionally chose one. And this is the one. So everything here, and I will allude to another one maybe, but you, you can see here, every single detail that is here transpires. But let me take this one here, the pillar. Very interesting, very interesting that God will be detailed in what he will do. Have, have you ever thought about the pillars? Let's go. These are the pillars. You have them in your Bible in Exodus 38. How many were they? You recall? Exodus 38, we can just quickly go to the word of God. You will remember that God said there will be 20 on one side, 20 on the other side. It makes how many? 40, and then 10 on one side, and then 10 on the other side, it amounts to 60. God never does something haphazardly or accidentally. You will see why these were 60. Can you imagine? God, God could have said, okay, there will be 80. There will be 100. But why 60? Now, let's start our brief Bible study I would take you to the pillars. You can see them here, but we will zoom on the pillars. This is what a pillar of the sanctuary look like. Now, for you, who, who, who represents these pillars then? I just told you. Can I come a little closer? But I will not go beyond here. <laughs> Every single detail is about what? The goal of God, his intention to reconnect with man. So expect this lesson appearing here. Expect this lesson perspiring from here. You will see it just now. Now, who are the pillars? The good thing with scripture is that nothing will come from my mind. I will just ask a question and the Bible will give the answer. Amen? Amen. That's why I like studying the Bible, because it answers its own question. So my question to the Bible is, Bible, my dear Bible, can you tell me who are the pillars? 1 Timothy 3, 15. I have an advantage over you because it's already noted in my Bible, so I'll go there quicker than you. Sorry for that. 1 Timothy 3, 15. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar. Wow, we are starting now to answer this question. Who are the pillars? Remember, they are 60, and it's intentional why they are 60. My Bible says that the pillars, the pillars of this sanctuary, Pastor Sean, the pillars of our church here at Atleton, this, we are. We are the living church of God. Is the pillar. You look as if you are not convinced. I know that. I have been trained to be a teacher, so I know when you are not convinced. Okay, let me give you some more verses. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. And I will see that you will enjoy it more and more. What have we seen in 1 Timothy 3, 15? The pillars are the church S. That's S. But let's be more precise. Revelation 3, 12. Now it will maybe be more clearer, precise. Him who overcomes, I will make him a, a pillar. Oh, I am a pillar. Oh, you are a pillar. Oh, still not convinced? <laughs> Let me give you a last verse. And this one will be taken from Galatians 2.9. Galatians 2.9. James. Peter and John, those reputed to be pillars.
pillars. I think you are convinced now that pillars in this sanctuary, that is why it is we have 60 of them. If the figure 7 talks about something that is perfect, which would be divine, the number 6 represents what? Something that is human. That is why you see that over there. So the good news I have for you is that you and I, we are those pillars. You and I, we are the pillars of our church. Are you with me? That's the good thing. I hope you would have said amen, because look at how many pillars we have in church here today. But have you wondered something? How can a pillar stand in the sand? Can a pillar easily stand in the sand? No, it will be difficult. That is why you and I, if we are pillars, or rather since we are pillars, we cannot stand on our own. My God knew that. He knew that as you and I we would be pillars, we will not be able to stand by ourselves. These pillars had a foundation. It had a socket. It had a base. Who is the foundation? 1 Corinthians 3.11 that will be the before last text that I want you to read this morning. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. For no other one laid any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So let's summarize what we have studied so far. In Scripture, the sanctuary is the place where we see God wanting to reach his ultimate goal of connecting with man. That is why he said, you will build me a sanctuary and I will dwell in the midst of you. Because I want to reconnect this connection that we had at the Garden of Eden that was lost. I want to restore it. And through the sanctuary, we see God's desire to restore that relationship. I'm taking you to only one element, the pillar, which would be among the first thing you would see when you would come to the sanctuary. The pillar, Bible is clear, it's you and I. The one who will overcome, I will make of him a pillar in the house of God. Those people, James and John, were reputed and they were called pillars. The church is the pillar. Disciples like you and I who support the church of the living God, we are pillars. But we cannot stand on our own. These pillars were in the sand. They could only stand because they were firmly riveted on a foundation. And the Bible just clearly spelled out that this foundation is no one else but Jesus Christ. That is why our church of at Atleton, regardless of the number of nationalities we represent, regardless of who you are as a pillar, we can stand because we are firmly riveted on the only foundation, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Now, you know that God, when he does something, he does it thoroughly so that you can understand because he has one thing in mind. You know that in the Bible, for example, if you were to take the laver, it's a basin as well. The Bible says it's in bronze, right? And do you know what God used to, what, what, what type of bronze was that? The Bible is very, very specific. Do you have one second? We can go to, very easy to remember, 38.8. Exodus 38, 8. Follow me attentively. Don't give up on me. I, um, you're about to learn something extraordinary from the Bible in the next few seconds. Follow me attentively. When God wants to make a lesson clear, he is very detailed. And when he gives instruction on how to build this basin, this laver or laver, he will give clear instructions. And what is this? 38, 8. They made the bronze basin, says my Bible, and the bronze stand using what? The mirrors. Mirrors of who? The women. Did you know that? That the 
lover was built by mirrors. Of course, you will recall that at that time, Maggie, mirrors were not like the way they are today, right? Mirrors were just but bronze, polished ones. By the way, that is why Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, he says what? Because we see faintly through a mirror. Do you see faintly through a mirror that is in glass? No. He was alluding to a mirror that was in polished bronze. That's why he says, because we see faintly. Mirrors were in brass, in bronze. They were polished. And this is what ladies used to have. Can you imagine carrying this in your wallet today? <laughs> but God says, wait, I need to build this basin. And this basin needs to be built in bronze. And I need something from you to build it. And you know the meaning of that basin, don't you? The place it was situated is vital. You had just accepted the sacrifice of Jesus on the altar, right? And you were going to the tabernacle to meet with God. In between, you find this, which would be a symbol of baptism. Now listen, God says, God says, I'm taking you somewhere, follow me attentively. God says, when the material that I will use to build something is important, I tell you what it is. What was it? Mirrors of who? Ladies. Meaning, when you come to God, you have to surrender something. You know what it would mean today? Let's say Pastor Sean and Pastor John said, we need a new pulpit, and we will make one in glass, okay? And we will make an appeal to all of you. All of you will bring the screens of your cell phones, of your smartphones. Ah, ha, ha, ha. I can hear some of you. And then Pastor Sean will have a big container here. And then I hope that there will be three lines, one here, one here, one there. And all these cell phones ready to be surrendered to build the glass pulpit. And the song would be sung, I surrender all. You could see some of them struggling to surrender that cell phone, right? I can imagine someone would surrender only one and the other one would remain in the other pocket. Am I right, my man? Am I right? Th 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 that was the same idea. God says, you women, I need... In fact, it's not the mirror that he needs. It's not the mirror that he needs. He needs that spirit of surrendering. And it so happens that the dearest thing the women had at that time was a mirror in brass. Can you imagine? Huh? The dearest thing they had was a mirror in brass. Thank God we have real mirrors now. <laughs> but you get the point? When God wants to teach a lesson, and what is the lesson here, Rebecca? It's a lesson of surrendering, right? You give something that is near and dear to you. God says, give that to me. I will transform it into something that will be a blessing for the whole congregation. That's the lesson. Now, you are pillars, aren't you? We are riveted on Jesus, aren't we? I have a question for you. It would be good to see what was the material God used to make the pillar, right? Who wants to know the answer? Does my question make sense to you? Because in every single detail, God will teach a lesson. We saw one just now. So it would be good for us to see which material he will use to build the pillar, which is you and I. You want to know the answer? Quickly, because of time. Let's rush to Gen uh, uh, Exodus 26. Was the question we want to answer now? What was the material the pillars were made of? Are you with me? Sorry, what, 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 what did I say? Exodus 26, sorry. Th 26, right? I said 26. I'm very sorry. I think it's the pressure of time on me. It's the pressure of time. Sorry, it's not, uh, it's not 26, sorry. It's 29. Excuse me. What's the, what's the question? What's the question? 
What were the pillars made of? Sorry, which, which text did I say? 29. You know, I beg your pardon. I think it's the pressure of preaching before your two pastors. You know, it's not easy for me to preach before my dear Pastor Sean and my dear Pastor John. I am stressed here. So, uh, excuse me, I did a big mistake. Come with me, excuse me. Maybe I should check my notes. Maybe I should check my notes. Uh, come with me to Exodus 41. You will find the answer there, I'm sure, because I just checked my notes. Exodus. What, 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 what's the problem? There is no Exodus 41? I'm in big trouble. Now, this was done intentionally. Don't report me to the GC saying that you have sent a preacher who does not even know his Bible reference. Please, don't tell that to Pastor Ted. Nor to my boss. This was intentional. And now that I have your attention, let me share with you one of the clearest lessons of grace that you will find in this pillar. If we were to find the answer, we would have found it in two places in Scripture. Either Exodus 27 or in Exodus 38. These are the two places where we have a vivid, detailed description of how the pillars should be. I've read it over and over and over and over again. You know what I tried? I tried reading it, Brian. I tried reading it in Hebrew. And I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I tried the little Hebrew I know to read it in Hebrew. You know, I'm not a Hebrew scholar because Hebrew scholars, they dream in Hebrew. When I was studying Hebrew, I had nightmares in Hebrew. <laughs> so for sure, I'm not a Hebrew scholar like you, Doc. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I read it over and oh, th this is getting so interesting now. I want to come closer to you, but, but I, I have to stay here, right? <laughs> this, is the, the, this is it, this is it. I wanted to be sure that my point was clear, so I contacted the highest authority in Old Testament languages who exist on earth in the Adventist setting. That's Dr. Roy Gain and Dr. Jacques Ducan. You call him Ducan, but his name is Ducan. And this is what they told me. I'll put a quotation of, of, from them in a few moments. But listen to the point. Nowhere in Scripture, what did I say? Nowhere in Scripture do we talk about the material that God used to build the pillars. Nowhere. Isn't that intentional? Listen to the lesson. The silence in itself is eloquent because it speaks volume about God's plan. He says, regardless of who you are, I want to use you. Let's say God had said these pillars were in gold. I would have said, God, you know that I'm not a pillar of gold. Look at me, God. You know I'm not in gold. If these were in, in I know that pastor likes wood, plywood, you know, plywood, you know. He said, what? Me? Relegated to the level of mere sheer plywood? Never, ever. He says, I, I challenge you. Can I challenge you? I'm challenging you because you don't give, you don't give me enough time, enough time to preach. And when you give me little time to preach, I give you lots of homework. <laughs> so that's your homework. Read again through the whole of Exodus. And there is nowhere in Scripture. Nowhere. God gives single details about everything else. Except the pillar. Because you are that pillar. And he says, regardless of the size of your bank account, regardless of your class, your caste, your race, the color of your skin, I don't care. I want you to serve as a pillar in my temple. And because it's not about you, you cannot stand on your own. You will be riveted on me, says God, as if it's not enough. Do you know that this is intentional from God? Nothing is done haphazardly. Nothing. Do you know that this temple, in the temple, no one could see the pillar? Why? Because it was hidden 
by a curtain of fine linen that was embroidered, twisted, extremely well done. What God is saying is, regardless of who you are, I need you as a pillar in my house, but it doesn't matter who you are. I want you. Because I know it's not about you because you have to be firmly riveted on me. And not only that, I will cover you. Can someone prepare an amen from the heart? Can I will cover you with my robe of righteousness so that you will not be seen. I will be seen. So when you came to the sanctuary on the morning, you would never see the pillar. You would see the base, Jesus Christ. You would see the pillar covered. And we prayed about it one night. I, I can't remember which night we prayed about the robe of righteousness of Christ that covers us. So that no one sees us because we are just but feeble pillars. But when we are firmly riveted on Jesus and covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, only Jesus is seen. That is why you and I can be a pillar in the house of the Lord. And that is why when he covers us with, he just covering our sins. And then the Bible says he will cast the sins where? Deep down into the sea. And then I add, he will post a sign that reads, fishing prohibited. <laughs> just in case you try to fish your own sins back. Or the devil tells you, take this swimming costume and go back there and take them. No, he cast your sin deep down into the sea and he posts a sign, fishing prohibited. That is why you and I can be a pillar in the house of Jesus. Because it's not about us. We are not even seen, young people. We are riveted on Jesus, covered by Jesus. If you, had, if you had added 10 minutes, I would have even shown you, but I'm not planning to do that today. No, 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 no. I, that's, that's your homework. The pillars had a hook on top of each one of them. Because not only, you, you know, you, you can stand on your own, but 60 pillars had to be linked with each other. You had to be linked with each other. That's your homework. There was a hook on top of it, and the hook, the Bible says, was in silver. Wow. Why so many details, God? No, I can't go there because I would have, I would, I will, if I continue, I will explain to you. you have the, that's your homework. Why were these hooked on top in silver? And it helped the pillars to remain because there was one thing that, re, that, that joined them together. That is why, regardless of our diversity, we can be united in Jesus. And we can be united in the word of God, we need to close. Often, young people have come to me and have said, Pastor, I really want to be that pillar. They have come to me and said, Pastor, how can I have a vibrant prayer life? And our dear pastor has told me that today we are concluding the, the, the theme of prayer that we would have had during this whole month. So let me conclude by giving you four practical pointers on how you can be a strong pillar in the house of the Lord. Would you like to know that? How can you be a firm pillar, riveted on Jesus, covered by Jesus, and even the top of you would be linked to Jesus? It's burning my lips, I have to tell you. It was in silver. <laughs> it was in silver because we were purchased with perishable things. No, we were purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. And the silver is an idea of how our redemption came about. So we are riveted on Jesus. We are covered by Jesus. And on top of us, we are reminded of what Jesus did for us. Everything is about Jesus, 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 Jesus. Because the temple is, helps him to do what? reach the goal of bringing us back into close relationship with him again. And now let me end with giving you these five pointers. Oh, yeah. I, can I skip that one? These were just quotations. I know you believe me, right? I know you believe me. But in case you did not, 
I had the, I had the two explanations here from Exodus. Um, in fact, there, there are two or three uh, Bible references that, that are not true version of the original. I call them the perversion of the original. And this is the quotation from uh, Roy Gain and Jacques Ducan. So a number of English translations that say both the pillar and the bases were of bronze is incorrect. Nowhere in scripture we find the, the, the material of the, of the pillar, of the socket we know, of the base we know. And the other quotation is coming from Jacques Ducan saying that nowhere in scripture we have this material that God used. The socket was in bronze, but not. We assume that it was in acacia wood, but nowhere it is said, nowhere. And you have known by now that this is intentional, right? Because it's you and me, covered by Jesus, riveted by Jesus, reminded by our salvation. Let me end with these four pointers, if this one helps me. Now, I want this to be crystal clear in your mind as we wind up. I have not said concluded yet. Eh? I've said wind up. This is it. Prayer is used by God to contribute to his ultimate goal of bringing us in close relationship with him. How? You remember, I have evidentiary support, competent one, from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy telling me that God met with Adam and Eve in the morning in the garden and in the evening in the garden, and they had this close talk to one another. Are you with me? Now, what happened one day? Adam didn't show up. You remember? In these morning meetings they had, Adam did not show up. Why? This relationship was broken. This relationship was, inter was interrupted because Adam had sinned and he did not come to his daily meeting with God. Now, listen to that. Listen to where I'm taking you to. When you and I, what did I say? When you and I, we come to God in prayer every day, we are saying, God, where Adam failed you, I am here to try to reconnect this relationship with you. I am saying, God, I know you haven't changed your place because where you were sitting to meet with Adam is still where you are sitting. Adam left you. I'm coming back. I am coming back. And I want to have this relationship with you, this communication with you, this communion with you. So each time when we pray, we are going back. That, that's, that's what you need to remember. Each time we pray, we are going back to the ideal that God had for us to be communing with him. Am I making sense to your ears? Each time you pray, you are saying, God, I'm back. Can we have this relationship again? You remember the one you used to have with Adam? I want it now, and I'm here now. Speak, Lord. You see, my friends, there are four things I encourage you. Usually, I, I teach that, I preach that to my young people when they say, Pastor, what can I do? What's the pastor? What can I do? I give you four pointers, and then we will be, we will be concluding. Pointer number one, choose a time to pray. Practical things. Very easy. I have found it easier to pray early in the morning. There was a reason why God said that the manna had to be fetched, collected before the sun rose. Have you ever wondered why? It looks like there is a special blessing when you rise up before the sun. I found it very interesting to have my prayer life. I'm not a, I'm not a saint. Please pray for me. I try to do my best to have this communication with God on a daily basis. I found it more useful to have a specific time to pray. You know, we are creatures of habit, right? We are creatures of habit. If you have developed this habit to meet with God, and this is why now you come and you communicate with Him. So find a time to pray. I usually tell my young people, it's better for you to spend five minutes with God in the morning asking for his protection rather than spending five hours in the evening asking for forgiveness. <laughs> Am I making sense to your ears? It's better to spend five minutes with God early in the morning asking for his protection rather than spending five hours with him in the evening asking for forgiveness. 
and confessing your sins and repenting for them. Had you only asked him before, things would have been different. Now, I know that when it comes to prayer, it's not a question of, 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 of mind over matter. It's more of a question of mind over mattress. <laughs> because you and I find it very hard to wake up in the morning, right? And if you have to find some time before the sun rises, you have to be disciplined. I have a good news for you. This one you will read at home because I'm going to wind up very quickly now. I don't want you to, to say the pastor was too long in his sermon that the food is not okay there. So I will wind up very quickly. Read this verse for you, for you at home. Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. It tells you. Are you reading now? Now, No, at home I said. <laughs> it says, it says, God, wake me up in the morning so that you teach me to hear your voice. Do you want to practice that? You thought that your alarm clock, your alarm clock was waking you up, right? You thought that. No, it's not your alarm clock. It's not your alarm clock that wakes you up. It's the voice of the Lord that wakes you up. If alarm clock could wake up people, why don't you put some in the graveyard? <laughs> right? If alarm clock woke up people, put some in the graveyard. No, you wake up in the morning because God wakes you up. So find a time to pray. And stick to that. Stick to that time. Find a place to pray. Very quickly. Very practical things. You know, we are creatures of habit. I am sure at your place, you sit at the same place at the table when you have breakfast. For Every time you sit at the same place. And if you can afford it in your home, you have a place where you sleep, a place where you cook, a place where you eat, a place where you have shower, right? Don't you have a place where you can meet with God? Try to find that place. It can be just when you wake up from your bed. It can be, but try to find a time and try to find a place on the idea of time. Many young people have asked me, Pastor, what's the, what's the reasonable time? It's what you have. I usually tell them this. In one hour, you have four segments of 15 minutes. Therefore, in 24 hours, you have 96 segments of 15 minutes. Can you give one to God? 96 segments of 15 minutes. Can you give one to God? A time to pray, a place to pray. And when you go there, please keep in mind why you are there. You are saying to God, I'm back. Let's connect. I have a last statement. Last statement. The only reason why prayer is powerful, it is because it links us to the all-powerful uh, prayer answering, prayer hearing God. Amen? Amen? Now, I've trapped you. You said amen to that quotation, right? To that, so, to not quotation, statement. I can be mistaken because it's come from me. I could be mistaken. But I believe that the only reason why prayer is powerful, it is because it links us to an all-powerful God. Therefore, if you agree with this, it means that prayer in itself, and many people have, have criticized us as Christians. They have said, what? You close your eyes? You just utter a few words, not even before a statue, and you think that God will answer you? Let me tell you, don't leave now. I don't leave. Let me end the quotation. Don't leave. And if you are online, don't go and drink water now. You have to listen to the whole statement. Prayer in itself has no power. Don't leave. Don't leave, please. Prayer intrinsically in itself, it has no power. How do I know that? Now, this is the cable. This is the cable. Tell me, this cable in itself, does he, these copper, do, do they have power? No, but if I were to link this with power there, it would become a live wire. Therefore, the only reason why prayer is powerful is because prayer links us to a powerful God, to the powerhouse. That is why prayer becomes powerful. That is why they won't understand why you are just closing your eyes in front of nobody, uttering a few words and hoping God will answer. It is linking you to the source of power. That is why you should remember the, the, the purpose. And then I give you something. We practice it here during our 10 days of prayer with my two colleagues, pastors, and we had a few members who came every night, and we were practicing this. This is just a, 
uh, uh, some idea for you, and I will end with this. Take time to pray during that time. Connect with God. Here I am. Can we talk again like you did with Adam? I'm back. Acts is an acronym standing for adoration, confession, AC, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. I will leave you here. Our house at Athelton, our church at Athelton needs you as pillars. But it's not about you. Because you're riveted on Jesus. You are covered by Jesus. It's all about him. And if you want to be a strong pillar, I have shared this with you. And my colleagues shared also other practical things with you. And imagine how our church here at Atherton would be if each pillar represented here would spend time daily with God to become firmly riveted on Jesus. In spite of our differences, we can be united in the word of God. May God bless you as you continue to play your role of a pillar in the house of the Lord. This is my prayer for each one of you as well as for myself. Amen.